turn your Bible this evening to the book of Galatians and look at Galatians chapter number 1. Galatians chapter number 1. Now, in these studies, we're looking at right division, basic messages and studies dealing with right division of the Word of Truth. Tonight, we're looking at the fact that there's more than one gospel in the Bible. Galatians chapter number 1, Paul said in verse number 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, years ago, I put other meanings on that other than what it says. But since the Lord opened my eyes to the matter of right division, I understand that Paul, in verse 11, is very plainly saying that the gospel that he preached, he did not preach a gospel that another man preached before him. Also, he didn't receive this gospel from another man before him. Also, he was not taught this gospel by another man before him. He said, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the other day, I uh, mentioned to you that I had two Camelite preachers come to my house. And uh, this Camelite preacher, one of them said, well, he said, I met another man the other day who believed that the Pauline doctrines antedated the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And I said, well, I don't know of any man that believes right division of the Word of God that has ever taught that the doctrines of Paul antedated the doctrines of Jesus Christ. I said, the doctrines of the Apostle, the Apostle Paul preached, those doctrines that he preached were the doctrines revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. And the Lord Jesus Christ did not stop preaching and have nothing else to say after he went back to heaven. Instead, he gave by revelation to Paul the gospel of the grace of God. And then the Camelite preacher kind of admitted, he said, well, he said, uh, maybe I just put that word in, antedated. And I don't, I don't know the man he was referring to or whatever, but I know one thing. Right division of the word of God does not mean that Paul's preaching antedated that of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that Paul's preaching in any way took over from the Lord Jesus Christ. Right division of the Word of God, and Paul saying that the gospel that he received, he received it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, whenever we understand that and just simply believe it, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here upon this earth, preached upon this earth. He gave a gospel while he was here upon this earth, gave doctrines related to that here upon this earth. 
He was crucified, buried. He rose again the third day, ascended into heaven's glory, and then he saved Paul here. And whenever he saved Paul, he, the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, revealed to Paul further doctrines, preaching uh, the gospel of the grace of God. Paul did not make up anything. It's not Paul against Jesus Christ at all. It's Paul as the Lord Jesus Christ spokesman. The Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. The Lord Jesus needed a spokesman here upon this earth to give the message of what happened at the cross. Paul was that spokesman. And in Galatians chapter number 1, Paul said, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now turn your Bible, please, to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And I want you to hold the place in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and turn to Psalm 119 and hold Psalm 119. We're going to read Psalm 119, verse number 6. Then we're going to read 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Both of these verses have to do with not being ashamed. This morning in the message, we dealt with Psalm 119 and verse number 6. And in that message, we said that the primary reason, at least one of the primary reasons, for us being ashamed to preach and teach and witness is the fact that we are disobedient to the Word of God. That is, we may give, but we don't go. Or we may go, but we don't give. We may attend church, but we don't pray. We may pray, but we don't read our Bible. Even partial disobedience is disobedience. And so to the degree that we disobey the Word of God, to the same degree, we'll be ashamed to preach to other people and witness to other people. Have you ever had a problem on witnessing to others at work or wherever? Have you ever had a problem on going on visitation on Thursday night? Well, I believe one of the primary reasons is because we've been disobedient to God on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and starts off, of course, on Sunday. Some, the psalmist said in Psalm 119 and verse 6, Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. And even though I'm a dispensationalist, even though I believe we ought to rightly divide the Word of God, yet I'm not so dispensational that I believe that I do not have the responsibility to have respect unto all of God's commandments. I believe even the Ten Commandments furnish me learning, furnish me doctrine, furnish me reproof, furnish me admonition, furnish me warning. I realize I'm not under a Sabbath day observance, but I'll tell you this, I believe that I am very definitely responsible to be in this church when we meet. Now, I get the devotional uh, emphasis out of that thing. I realize God's people had certain times in the Old Testament they had to meet. I realized they had certain times when they were responsible to be in attendance to the preaching of God's Word. Well, brother, I believe in this day in which we live, we've got a responsibility to be in attendance to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And I can get that and get admonition from the Old Testament. So I should have respect unto all of God's commandments, not just a portion of them. We do not take just Romans through the book of Philemon and stay there. I've had some numb skulls and nitwits think that since you were dispensational that you didn't preach or teach out of the book of Exodus or you didn't preach and teach out of the book of Genesis. And the fact's known, really, uh, somebody that rightly divides the word of truth can handle the book of Exodus in a much more honorable, respectful fashion than someone who knows nothing about right division. You see, we are not saying that you can't get blessings from the word of God. We're in uh, the Old Testament. We're saying the blessings, the doctrines, and all the things are there, brother. But uh, I'll tell you this. I need to have respect unto all of God's commandments, all of them, not just ones I like. Certain ones I like because I don't have any problem with them. But I'll tell you this. I have problems with some of them, and those, I'll have to admit, sometimes I don't like them. I don't love them like I should because it gives me trouble. It costs me. And so whenever I'm disobedient to the Word of God, then I'm ashamed. And that's the first thing. 
But look at this, and this is what we're looking at tonight. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Since I have believed the King James Bible, when I say I believe that, I believe it. I don't add, don't subtract, simply believe it. Since I have been a Bible believer, a lot of my shame has gone when I had to deal with people. Uh, no longer do I have to back up on things like I used to do. Brother, I tell you, when you believe a King James Bible, the King James Bible will give you authority and you will not be ashamed. Now, respect to the Word of God. And then, of course, the obedience matter, obeying the Word of God as well as, as, well as uh, I should have a heart dedication and devotion to the Word of God as well as lip service to it. And then whenever I come to the matter of right division, there's a second thing that helps me. And that is this, not only believing the Word of God, but rightly dividing the Word of truth. What a blessing that's been as, uh, as I've been able to just rightly divide the book and understand these things. This is uh, one of those things that uh, whenever you go to TV school, they teach you don't do that. You're supposed to be real nice and kind, but you have to do things like that to foul up, you know, a uh, certain thing. I was preaching up in Memphis, and they were doing a videotape of the thing, and uh, I forget what it was. I stepped on the... I dropped my chalk. That's what it was. I had some chalk, and, and I dropped the chalk and then stepped on it. And I mean, made it. they had a beautiful carpet there, and it just made... I could just imagine what the janitor... made the janitor lose his salvation whenever he saw me step on that chalk. And the guy got it on film and all. You know, he carried the thing right on. So uh, uh, those, those are those things, you know, to check and make sure your mic's on and make sure it's right. You're not supposed to do whenever you're doing it, but I'm going to do it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, since I have known something of right division, don't claim to know it all, but since I have known something of right division, my, what a blessing that is and what power that is to be able to witness to people and talk to people, and you don't have to back down to the cults. And brother, you don't have to back down to the false doctrine. Those Camelite preachers the other day, man got to talking about Acts 2.38 and the preposition there, ice and so on, and I said, look, I said, uh, I believe Peter said exactly what the King James Bible says. I believe Peter required baptism, water baptism, in order to get the gift of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2.38. I said, I ain't arguing with nobody on that. And I'm not. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Brother Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 38 has given more than one Baptist a run and fit. And brother, I'm a Baptist preacher. Whenever I say that, I still say that Acts 2.38 says exactly what it says, means exactly what it says, and God meant for it to say exactly what it says. God didn't mean to say, be baptized because of. I believe God said exactly what he meant to say. And I'm going to tell you something else. I do not subtract Mark chapter 16, the ending of the chapter off. I leave it just where it is. Signs, wonders, the emphasis upon baptism, the whole thing there, leave it just as it is. Don't not going to take a thing off. But brother, what a blessing it's been to open up the Word of God and to know something about right division and, and to see the shame go away when you face people with these issues and these things. You see, the matter of having respect to the Word of God first, then secondly, the matter of rightly dividing the Word of God will remove a lot of your timidity about witnessing. Amen. Brother, just take it away. Because you've got the ammunition, man, when you got that. you got the book and right division of it. Brother, that's the key to it. Nothing has given me confidence like those two things. And notice it says, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. I realize that the judgment seat of Christ, in order for me, for me not to be ashamed, I should be and should have been doing some right division. But also we're talking about a man who's working here now, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed.
Brother, if you've been working in the Word of God like you're supposed to, and sister, if you've been working in the Word of God like you're supposed to, if you've been studying to show yourself approved unto God, and you were not concerned about being a Presbyterian, Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Methodist or a Pentecostal or Episcopalian or whatever, I get so tired of asking folks, are you saved? And they say, well, I go to the Methodist church. That's got nothing to do with it. I asked uh, someone the other day, I said, are you saved? They said, well, I go to an Episcopal church. In fact, I asked a man the other day, I said, are you saved? He said, my wife goes to the Episcopal church. <laughs> he doesn't move that thing twice removed. And I, I had a hard time letting him know I was talking about him. It's funny how sin will close your eyes and close your heart and keep you from uh, realizing, recognizing your sin, your own need. You see, study to show thyself approved unto God. Brother, let these preachers call me ultra. One of the brethren said the other day, our brother down in Florida down there refers to me as an ultra dispensationalist. Well, let him refer to me as an ultra dispensationalist if he wants to. Others call me hyper dispensational. And all those things mean is you're just more than they are. Why, some of, the, some of these men have taught and preached things. Some, some of the men that call you an ultra dispensationalist have preached and taught these same things, and they've dropped them because they realize that some of the Baptist brethren can't take it. Right. Amen. And, brother, some of the Baptist brethren can't take it, so they cut off your meetings. Well, brother, I'll tell you what. I'm going to study to show myself approved unto God, and if every church cuts them off, let them cut them off. Brother, it says, approved unto God, not to the Baptists, not to the Methodists, not to the Presbyterians, not to the Catholics. I'm not concerned with them. I'm concerned with being approved unto God. Now, the book says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when you rightly divide the word, then you'll not be ashamed. Now, what about this gospel that Paul preached? He said, brethren, he said, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was it taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, how can you show in the Word of God, or how can you understand the Word of God there's more than one gospel? Well, first of all, let's look at this gospel that Paul preached. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and see the gospel that Paul preached. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, some of these brethren, trying to get away from the issues, have tried to make the gospel a much broader thing than that. But anybody studying the Word of God and spending much time in Bible study knows that there are three principal truths of the gospel that we preach. First of all, the main central truth is, as you find it in verse number 3, Christ died for our sins. That's first. Then secondly, verse number 4, and that he was buried. You see, you're getting ready for a bodily resurrection. And then the third thing found in verse 4, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now notice how this, these three things are bounded by according to the Scriptures. All of this was according to the Scriptures. Other things may come and go around this, and there are many other things that are related to it, but those three points are crucial. Christ died for our sins, Christ was buried, Christ rose again the third day, and brother, all those are bounded by according to the Scriptures. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very heart of the gospel that Paul preached. That is the very heart of the gospel, I believe. 
Now, I'll tell you, I didn't know all the doctrines the day I got saved. But I knew one thing. Christ died for my sins, and Jesus Christ would save me right now if I trusted. You know, I'd accepted the death, burial, and resurrection when I called upon Jesus without really knowing all the theological terminology. God truly saved me by grace. God saved me by grace because there I was. I did not know the Bible. I did not know any translation issues. I did not know any right division issues. I did not know who John Boyce was from some other fellow. I didn't know who uh, Lancelot Andrews was from John Wycliffe. I did not know any of the, the matter of, of history. I did not know any theological terms. I would not know, have known what propitiation was if somebody had said it 45 times before me. I would not have understood it. Listen, all I saw was this. I knew that the church couldn't save me. My goodness couldn't save me. I knew that baptism couldn't save me. I knew that no man could save me. I knew the Bible said Christ died for my sins and Jesus Christ was alive right now. I knew he had died and I knew they'd put him in a tomb and I knew he got up out of that tomb and ascended into heaven and when I called upon him, brother, I believed that he was alive at the right hand of God the Father and he was going to hear my prayer and he did. Now, brother, that's the very heart of the gospel. There are other things around it. The gospel is not, verse 5, he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. I had one bird-brained Baptist try to tell me that. And he's a saved bird brain, but he's a local church-only bird brain. And he tried to tell me that another part of the gospel is being seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that being seen of five hundred. No, no, no! Brother, when I stand and preach the gospel, I don't have to mention him being seen of the 12 or the 500 or whatever. Brother, now it's true that he was. And it's true that there were many infallible proofs of his resurrection. But brother, it's also true that the heart of the gospel is Christ died for our sins, he was buried and he rose again. You see, what good would it be to have a Savior dying for our sins who stayed dead? You see, he had to be raised the third day. Only by conquering the grave and death and hell could he be our Savior. If he had not conquered them, then that meant the wages of sin had conquered him. And there would be no Savior. Paul emphasized this later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he said, uh, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. Your faith is also vain. Brother, death, burial, and resurrection is the very heart of the gospel we preach. And any person who's gotten into church and uh, taken on the name Christian and have never they've never believed that Christ died for their sins, and when they called upon the Lord, they were calling upon a Savior who was a resurrected Savior. If they've gotten somehow into church and they call themselves Christian and take the title on, listen, I'm going to tell you something. They are lost, lost, lost. The gospel Paul preached was Christ died for our sins. And if you didn't know it when you walked the church aisle, and if you didn't know it whenever you got your name put on the books, if you didn't know it, you're lost and you need to get saved. You say, but preacher, I'm a good person. I try to come to church and I tie and give. That has nothing to do with it. The gospel is that by which you get saved. Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel by which also ye are saved. You must believe that or have believed that Christ died for your sins. It's very simple. You see how plain it is? It's not getting baptized for your sins. You're not baptized for the remission of your sins under the gospel that Paul preached. You, are, you do not pay money for your sins under the gospel that Paul preached. You do not join a church for your sins. You don't give an offering for your sins. You don't confess to a priest for your sins. The Bible says Christ died for our sins. What's the only payment? How's your sin going to be handled? It was handled once and for all. Christ died, past tense. It's not Christ is dying for your sins. It's past tense, already done, complete, finished, forever. Jesus died for your sins. Now, have you trusted that? Have you believed that? Is that what you have in memory? If you don't have that in your memory, then you're not saved. You might have heard somebody say it before, but if that is not a part of you, then you're not saved. 
you are not saved. Christ died for our sins. And my friend, when you turn your head toward heaven and you know the Word of God says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, you're not calling upon a Lord that's still in the grave, but you're calling upon the Lord who is seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, who conquered the grave and death and hell. And He is the resurrected Lord and Savior. That's the heart of the gospel. If I were to go up to a door and knock on a door, and I would say, and the person comes to the door, and I'd say, sir, are you saved? He'd say, why, yes, yeah, sure I'm saved. I said, how do you know you're saved? And he said, well, I'm keeping the Ten Commandments. And I'd question him very carefully, and I'd ask him again. I'd say, sir, are you sure that's what you're trusting to take it up? And he said, yes, that's what I'm trusting. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. That man is lost, lost, lost. I don't care if he is the mayor of this town or if he was the head of a large, some kind of group that helped other people and done many things. He's lost, and if he dies, he's going to die and go to hell. You see, the Bible says Christ died for our sins. Turn your Bible, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 1, Paul said, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we've received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now, if Paul's gospel be hid to a man, or be hid to a woman, or be hid to a young person, my friend, you're lost. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I have preached this message before, and use this particular verse before, and there have been people sitting in the congregation who for the first time saw that the gospel of the grace of God had been hid to them up to that time. For some reason, somehow, they had spent years in religion and never had seen the simple fact of salvation. They still were thinking, somehow, although hearing it said again and again that Christ died for our sins, somehow they were trusting their works to get them to heaven. Listen, my friend, the devil like to keep you blinded and like to keep this truth from you and like to keep you from accepting this truth and receiving this truth. Paul said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. How, how can you be saved? by accepting that, by receiving that as your sin payment. Receive it by faith. That is the only way to be saved. Now, if that gentleman cannot bring forth a clear testimony of salvation, it may be his problem is not just speaking it out, but his problem is it's not down here in the heart. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. You see, I don't believe that you can be saved and not know it. I don't believe there's anything such as unconscious salvation. I've seen a lot of unconscious people. But I don't think there's anything such as unconscious salvation. And I believe this. If you are saved, brother, you're going to be able to say, Christ died for my sins. And you're going to realize that. You're going to know the things I'm saying right now. You're going to know it's not in a Baptist church. It's not in your works. It's not in anybody else. And brother, listen, I knew that before I ever left to go to any school. I'd just come in out of the bars and there on my knees beside that bed. Brother, I knew salvation was in Christ. And that payment had been made once and for all. What I, as a dirty, filthy, rotten, reprobate sinner, what I needed was that. That was the only answer I had. That was the only hope I had. And I called upon the Lord that night, and he saved me. Now, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Turn your Bible, please, to Luke chapter number 9. Now, Paul has just 
been talking about the gospel that he preached. God called Paul and gave to him the revelation of the grace of God. This does not mean that Paul originated it, but rather the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven gave Paul this revelation. He said, the gospel which I preached is not after man. Why, Paul couldn't get it from Peter. Have you ever wondered why God kept Paul separate from Peter, and James, and John? Why, it's because Peter, James, and John could not give Paul his ministry. The Lord Jesus Christ gave to Paul his ministry. Now, it is true that the Lord over here before the cross preached and sent disciples and whatever here upon this earth. In Luke chapter number 9 and in verse number 1, the Bible says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece, and whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now notice, it was the twelve in verse number one. They go out, and in verse number six, the Word of God says they were preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel, the twelve. So in Luke chapter number nine, under the Lord Jesus Christ ministry, these twelve go out and they preach the gospel. There is no doubt about it. The Word of God says it. No need to change it. No need to question it. Just believe it. Respect unto all thy commandments. So they go out and they preach the gospel. I know there are some men preaching a gospel here in Luke chapter 9. Now turn to Luke chapter number 18. Luke chapter number 18. In Luke chapter number 18, nine chapters later in the Word of God, in Luke chapter 18, verse number 31, the Lord Jesus Christ takes the same 12 again. Luke chapter number 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the 12. These are the same 12 now that had been out preaching the gospel in Luke 9. So in Luke 18, later on, after Luke 9, after they've already been out preaching the gospel, the Lord takes those 12. Now watch. He said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Now there you have the very heart of the gospel given by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Luke 18, although he doesn't give the benefits of it. He doesn't give the meaning of it. He simply announces the three basic things of the gospel Paul's going to preach over here. You see, the Lord Jesus says, He'll be delivered, they'll scourge him, put him to death, and the third day rise again. He'll be put to death, then he's going to rise again, which implies a burial in between. If he rises, he's going to be buried. And so that the Lord Jesus Christ gives the very basis of the gospel we preach in this day. Now watch the next statement in verse number 34. Number one, and they understood none of these things. Number two, and this saying was hid from them. Number three, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Now, for the life of me, I cannot understand how some people would claim that these men preach the same gospel we preach. You see, Paul said over here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 that the gospel we preach is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the very heart of that gospel. You cannot preach the gospel in this age without preaching the death, burial and resurrection. And I'll guarantee you this, you are not going to preach something that is hid to you, that you don't understand and that you don't know. You preach that which you understand. You preach that which is open to you. You preach that which is known to you. Well, brother, they went over here and they preached in Luke chapter number 9, a gospel, and according to Luke chapter 18, they did not know the death burial and resurrection 
those things were hid to them and they didn't understand it. Well, wait a minute. Are these lost men over here? Why, no, there's only one that's lost, and that's Judas Iscariot, and he was a devil. But the other 11 are saved men, and Jesus said, none of you is lost except the son of perdition, referring to Judas Iscariot. You see, those are saved men. They go out and they preach a gospel. The gospel they preach cannot be the same gospel we preach because whenever the very basic elements of the gospel which we preach came up, those men, they didn't know. It was hid to them and they didn't understand it. Turn to Matthew chapter number 16 and look at Simon Peter. Now this is supposed to be, according to the Roman church, the first pope, fine pope that doesn't even know what you know. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem. Now notice how that from that time forth began Jesus. You see, Jesus hadn't always been talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. Why, to hear some preachers talk, you'd think everybody always preached on death, burial, and resurrection. But if you're going to be and understand your Bible, you've got to understand these men did not always know the death, burial, and resurrection. Ah, oh, sure, there were many types and figures and shadows back here. But these types and figures and shadows were just that. You have to wait till you get the, over here in the light to understand the shadows. You don't understand the light from the shadows. You don't live in the shadow and know what it is to live in the light. After you're in the light, brother, then you can go back and you can learn some things from shadows. You don't start back over here. You see, in Matthew 16, from that time forth, I mean when you pick up your Bible, just read it. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. You know why a lot of Seventh-day Adventists are going to die and go to hell? Because they started in the Old Testament whenever they started thinking about things of the Lord and they think they're saved by keeping the law. Or they think they're saved by a portion of keeping the law and keeping the doctrines of Christ. You know, you know why a lot of Camelites are going to die and go to hell? I'll tell you why. Because they started in Acts 2 in reading their Bible and they made their so-called profession on the basis of Acts 2 or Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. You know why a lot of Baptists are going to die and go to hell? I'll tell you why. Because they didn't start in Romans. They had no Romans preacher. They had no preacher around who knew that the book of Romans is God's book of doctrine for this age. Brother, they grew up on gospel of the kingdom preaching. That gospel of the kingdom had a hidden cross and had a hidden meaning on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So Jesus took his disciples and the word of God says he showed them how they must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Can you imagine Simon Peter telling the Lord, Look, no, Lord, don't go to the cross. Whenever Simon Peter had been preaching the cross all that time, how ridiculous. You see, Simon Peter's gospel, which he had been preaching, did not include the gospel that we preach. That gospel of the kingdom was one thing. The gospel which we preach is another altogether. Right division of the Word of God will cause you to understand these things, and it will make you where you're not ashamed. Word of God says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth.